Hello, everyone. Uh, the topic for today's lecture is uh, disorders of absorption. I am Dr. Devendra Barwa, and uh, today we'll be discussing about uh, all the malabsorptive disorders. This lecture is based on Harrison, and uh, it is not very vast, but uh, we have tried to cover most of it. So we'll be discussing this this. Uh, presentation under the following headings. First, we will discuss about case scenarios. Then we will see overview digestion. Then disorders of luminal phase of digestion, disorders of mucosal phase of digestion, disorders of post mucosal phase of digestion. Now, it is it should be clear here only that uh, the digestion has got three phases: luminal phase, mucosal phase, and post mucosal phase. And similarly, we can divide the diseases. Uh, in these three categories. So before going further, uh, I would like to show you a few case scenarios. Let's say this is case scenario one. A patient had an episode of assault in the form of an abdominal stab injury. He underwent laparotomy and was found to have a severely injured small intestine. Therefore, about 150 centimeter of terminal ileum had to be resected. Discharge in a stable condition, he develops recurrent diarrhea and weight loss on follow-up with repeated sterile stool cultures. Probably, he has developed malabsorption and is having A. Fatty acid diarrhea, B. Bile acid diarrhea, C. Enterokinase deficiency, or D. Bacterial overgrowth syndrome. The next scenario is, diarrhea which is resolved by fasting is generally A. Osmoti diarrhea, B. Secretary diarrhea, C. Dysmotile diarrhea, or D. Tellus diarrhea. Next question is, a newborn who is developing severe diarrhea with milk or any other meal containing glucose or galactose, this is lethal disease, but still this infant can be fed with A, lactulose, B, lactose, C, sucrose, or D, fructose. So I will not be telling you the answers to these problems. And I hope that after seeing this lecture, after discussion this lecture, you will be able to answer these problems by yourself. So let's start with the overview of digestion, how digestion is happening. We are now discussing the physiology of digestion. So there are three phase digestion, as we discussed already. One is the luminal digestion, second is the intestinal mucosal digestion and absorption, and third is the post-mucosal absorption. Now we can understand that we have a gut, we have a gut. In gut, all the enzymes are getting mixed with the food, and within the gut lumen itself, all these enzymes are working, and your food is started to be digested. Once this, this food material is, uh, is digested into smaller units, let's say uh, polypeptides or disaccharides or let's say small lipid molecules, all these digested particle food particles it will settle to the mucus, mucus layer of the uh, gut. And there also there are so many mucosa associated enzymes are there which can digest the food further. And ultimately all these digested food will be absorbed by the mucosa and will enter either portal vein or will enter either lymphatics depending whether this is a carbohydrate, fat or protein. So as we discussed, there are three phases of digestion. Similarly, the dis disorders of malabsorption can be divided into three types, in, into three uh, divisions. So there can be either inadequate digestion because of uh, your deficiency of any enzyme or let's say there is no no uh, condit, there is no uh, time for digestion or there can be disorders which are associated with impaired mucosal absorption or there can be mucosal loss or defect or there can be post mucosal defect. Many pathologies or disease can have one or more than one kind of mechanism when the absorption, malabsorption is developing. Apart from these diseases, we can see there are endocrine and metabolic disorders which can uh, lead to malabsorption, including diabetes, hyperparathyroidism, adrenal insufficiency, hyperthyroidism, and carcinoid syndromes. So we'll discuss some of the important ones uh, further in our discussion. So let's say how the patients of malabsorption are presenting. In general, the manifestation, manifestation of malabsorption can be very, very uh, uh, diverse. Some patients may be asymptomatic, some can present with diarrhea, some can present with specific nutrient deficiencies, but in general, the most common symptom is diarrhea. 
as such there is no consensus what is the normal amount of stool that one one uh, human being human being is is passing generally the amount is less than 200 gram or 200 ml of stool in 24 hours the thing is that different uh, societies and uh, different uh, in cultures in different cultures the stool habits are different so it can be two to four times per day to uh, as low as once a week <clears throat> so therefore there is no much consensus on this but still uh, we take a definition of more than 200 ml or gram of stool as definition for diarrhea so diarrhea is the most common symptom with which the patients of malabsorption syndrome are presenting to us in clinics then uh, there can be specific nutrient deficiency or they can present with steatorrhea steatorrhea is nothing but it is <clears throat> it is the present of presence of undigested fat so what happens when we are taking a fat meal uh, most of it is generally absorbed because of the help of bile salts and then pancreatic and gastric lipids but in conditions of malabsorption what can happen uh, the fat can remain undigested and unabsorbed and can present into your stool so more than 7% of ingested fat if present in stool then it is uh, taken as a uh, definition of shitoria and uh, for quantification of uh, fat in the stool generally 72 hours stool collection test is done which is also considered as gold standard before going further i would like to uh, just focus upon types of diarrhea these are types of chronic diarrheas so chronic diarrhea can be either secretory causes or osmotic causes steatorial causes inflammatory causes dysmotile causes factitial causes or iatrogenic causes secretory causes is because of sec hypersecretion by the mucosa because of either toxins or because of ongoing inflammations and osmotic causes are because of presence of osmotically active substance in your diet or in the liver the gut for example your <clears throat> let's take example of lactose intolerance if lactose deficiency is there lactose is not absorbed lactose is there in the gut which is fermented by bacteria presenting and then it can uh, produce osmotically active substances which will hold or draw water because of its osmotically active nature into the gut lumen and that's how there can be diarrhea secretory causes osmotic causes can be differentiated by the fact that osmotic diarrhea is generally resolved once you start fasting while secretory diarrhea will not resolve <clears throat> then any disease which is causing maldigestion or uh, let's say malabsorption of uh, fat then that there can be diarrhea for example if there is uh, uh, widespread inflammation in the gut or there are any other defects <clears throat> inflammatory causes are there ibds then lymphocytic and colitis colitis are there then immune related injuries are there or vicious disease there then this mortal cause so what can happen either there can be increased motility of the gut or there can be decreased motility of the gut if suppose there is increased motility of the gut for example in case of hyperparathyroidism so what happens because the motility is high there is no enough time for the enzymes to act on the food material and everything is passed out that's how diarrhea is happening in case of diseases where the motility of the gut has reduced because of this motility what can happen there can be lots of bacterial overgrowth with bacterial overgrowth there can be more more deconjugation of your bile acids more deconjugation of bile acids means that less of effective bile acid will be produced in your will be retained in your gut and that can lead to fat malabsorption then there are factitial causes you may find many patients of munchausen uh, disease in in which in that what can happen patient can bring you stool and they can mix water or let's say urine in that stool and then they can they can they can uh, uh, fake that they are suffering from chronic diarrhea then apart from that, there can be eating disorders, laxative misuse can be there. Then iatrogenic causes are there when surgeries are done and a lot of uh, big chunk of gut is removed, then also patient can develop diarrhea. So these are the mechanisms by which a patient may have chronic diarrhea. So let's see how our digestion is happening. We already have uh, read about this in our physiology. We were just devising it. So this figure is showing the normal uh, GIT tract gastrointestinal tract uh, right from the mouth to the uh, rectum and we know that roughly one to two liter of uh, fluid we are having intake of one to two liter of fluid daily in the form of food or water 
Roughly six to seven liters of enzymes are being, being produced daily. That means our gut is handling daily of around nine liter of fluid. So almost all of this is reabsorbed in our gut and only less than 200 ml of uh, amount is remaining that is passed out as excretory material or we can we know it is stools. So generally it should happen if it is not happening. Suppose if there is any problem with digestion, problem with absorption, then this amount will be high voluminous that is actually diarrhea. So now see. In lumen, we have so many enzymes, salivary amylase, lingual and gastric lipases, gastric acid, pancreatic enzymes, and bile salts. Similarly, in mucosa, we have so many mucosa-associated enzymes, disaccharides are there, enterokinase is there, peptidases are there. And then post-mucosal, basically what is happening, whatever being digested in your gut and in mucosa is being absorbed either in your, uh, in the form of mixed missiles, which contain lipids, or they can be simple nutrients, they go into portal vein and go to liver. Coming to lipid digestion. So generally what happens, we know that there is a gastric lipase, there is a pancreatic lipase. In general, gastric lipase is, is minimal and the main role that is played in your lipid digestion is your pancreatic lipase. So what happens, the first thing is that all these fatty acids, they are present as long chains. Uh, there can be short chain, medium chain or long chain fatty acids. Generally more than 12 carbons are there. This is second and long chains. 8 to 12 is medium chain and less than 8 carbon is short chain. So what happens, whatever food we are eating, whatever fat is there, that is generally in the long uh, chain fatty acid form. And these are acted upon by your gastric or pancreatic lipases and they will be broken down to the smaller forms. So what happens? That's your long chain fatty acids. They're generally using the glycerol molecule and three long chain fatty acids will be joined together and they will be forming triglyceride molecules. So these triglyceride molecules will be packed as chylomacrons when they will bound with the apple lipoprotein. Basically lipoprotein B is there. Lipoprotein B is there that will bind with these uh, triglycerides and chylomacrons will be formed. These big chylomacrons will be absorbed and they will they will be transported through via lymphatics. They will go through lymphatic and ultimately they will enter into the circulation uh, at the level of thrusty duct. Uh, medium chain triglycerides, they can simply be absorbed into blood and can go through portal vein. Short chain fatty acids generally are not absorbed. They are generally retained in the gut itself because the bacteria in our gut, they consume and they produce these short chain fatty acids. <clears throat> so let's see what defect can be there in the different phases. So there's a digestive phase, absorptive phase and post-absorptive phase. So as we discussed already that these pancreatic lipase and gastric lipase, they are doing lipolysis. Lipolysis means the bigger fat molecule is being broken down to smaller, uh, smaller chains. So suppose if there is lipase deficiency, for example, in case of chronic pancreatitis, then the lipolysis formation, lipolysis uh, process can be affected. Or suppose if bile acids are not there because of any reason, there can be defective missile formation. So here only I would like to tell you or I would like to make you understand the role of bile acids. So what happens, now understand this, this fat, fat is immiscible in water, we all know, right? So this fat has to be made miscible in water. So that happens when this fat is bound with your bile acids. So we have primary bile acids or secondary bile acids. So these bile acids, they are conjugated with your taurinoglycine to form bile salts. So these bile salts will lead to saponification of your these uh, fats. They will form, form small uh, uh, aggregates, small round aggregates. And uh, that's how then they can be absorbed. Suppose if there is deficiency of bile acids, then these missile will not form, form. So coming to your absorptive phase, so what can happen? Suppose if your mucosa is damaged because of any reason, let's say IBD or any other disease. So uh, no matter how much your fat is digested in your lumen, it will not be absorbed. Similarly, post-absorptive phase, so what can happen? There can be two things. So what one can be, there can be apple lipoprotein B deficiency. Because of apple lipoprotein B deficiency, there will be no formation of chylomicrons, so no fat will be absorbed. Or the other thing is what can happen that your patient is having normal uh, uh, 
liver bloating, normal fat absorption, but lymphatics somewhere distally, they are actually uh, 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 blocked or compressed. For example, lymph nodes are, are enlarged inside, lymphoma is there, whatever is there. So there can be lymphangitasia and uh, everything is, is uh, going out, not being absorbed. So that's typically seen in intestinal lymphangitasia. So digestive phase, absorptive phase, and post-absorptive phase, all these three phases are can be affected in your lipid maldigestion. So this is the, this is the figure from Harrison. We can see what happens in, we have these uh, fatty acids, then the lipolysis of these larger chains. These larger chains, chains can be bound with your glycerol molecule to form triglycerides. Then once these triglycerides form these triglycerides with the help of your bile salts and bile acids, this is a formation of missiles. These small missiles, then what happens? They can be absorbed in your genital mucosa uh, from the brush border. Once they go inside, then using the lipoprotein, apolipoprotein B, there can be formation of chylomicrons. These chylomicrons will go to your uh, lymphatics. The smaller fatty acid chains of uh, medium or small uh, uh, fatty acid chain, they can be directly absorbed into your jejunal, jejunal mucosa and they can directly enter your portal vein and they, then they could, can go to liver. So here only I would like to tell you one fundamental thing. You, you must have seen that we always tell our patients to be fasting when you want to see for lipid profile. So generally we order fasting lipid profile because now you can see here only if somebody has taken a meal and meal generally contains some amount of fat. That means immediately after the meal, the patient may have high level of triglyceride because of this, this thing only, because of absorption only. So therefore, we always ask our patient to do at least eight hours of fasting before giving sample for lipid profile. Coming to carbohydrate digestion. So generally, whatever carbohydrate we are eating is in the form of starch, sucrose, lactose, maltose, or sometimes some food materials contain some sim simple sugars like glucose and fructose. So what happens, these, these uh, carbohydrate molecules, they're acted upon by those salivary amylase right in the buccal cavity and pancreatic amylase in the gut. They can form simpler carbohydrate units like, units like maltose, alpha dextrins, lactose, sucrose, trihalose. And then in the gut itself, we have so many enzymes in the mucosa like uh, lactase is there, sucrase is there, trihalase, isomaltase, all these names are there. So all these, all these uh, uh, carbohydrate molecules, they'll be further broken down into simpler monosaccharides like glucose, fructose and galactose. So once these are formed, what happens? Now you can see this is the intestinal side and this is the uh, blood side. And this is basically your uh, mucosal lining of uh, gut. So what happens, we can see these glucose and galactose, they're actually entering via your GLUT2, 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 and fructose is entering uh, via GLUT5. So fructose is generally a facilitated diffusion and this glucose and galactose is sodium dependent active transport. So this channel is involved for, glut, uh, for glucose and galactose and the separate channel is for fructose. I'm telling you this because suppose if somebody is having GLUT2 deficiency, because of uh, defecting your SLCFI protein, then these patients may not be able to absorb at all glucose and lactose. And this is the patient who can be fed with fructose because fructose is being absorbed by a different channel. <clears throat> so this is the answer to the second problem, if you remember. Now coming to protein digestion. Protein digestion right away starts from your stomach. We know we have pepsinogen in the stomach. And this pepsinogen is broken down to pepsin with the action of your hydrochloric acid. And we have trypsinogen from pancreas, which is actually broken down into trypsin, activated into trypsin form by the action of brush border kind, enterokinase, which is present in duodenum. So once this trypsin is activated, what it does via cascade effect, it will activate other proteins, other enzymes, including chymotrypsinogen, proelastases, and procarboxypeptidases. So all these enzymes, once activated into their active forms, chymotrypsin, elastin, carboxypeptidase A and B, so these enzymes, as well as pepsin, what they do, they will they will break down the larger complex proteins into smaller units. So what happens? These largest poly larger polypeptides they will be converted into your small, either simpler peptides or they can be tripeptide, they can be dipeptide. So these tripeptides and dipeptides and simple amino acids they are absorbed into your jejunum and duodenum and ileum. So what happens? Suppose if the, the some dipeptides and tripeptides are also entering in these cells, 
within the jejunal cells, within the ileal cells and duodenal cells, what can happen? Because of action of intracytoplasmic uh, uh, peptidases, all these peptide, peptides also will be broken down to simple amino acids. And now the portal will be portal vein blood will be containing only simpler amino acids. So that's how protein is being digested and absorbed. So let's say this was the overview. Now let's say how actually nubilant phase of digestion is happening. So once we eat food, we take food to the mouth, we start mastication, then from, from the tongue and from the salivary gland, the secretion of uh, amylase, some amount of lipase, everything goes to our stomach. Stomach, there is a process of mechanical trituration, basically uh, bigger molecules, bigger food particles are broken down to smaller food particles. And all these things ultimately enter duodenum. Now remember, in our duodenum, we have, uh, from one side, we are having uh, bile coming, and once from one side, we are having pancreatic enzyme coming. Everything is entering into duodenum via CBD, common bile duct. So now, we'll be having lots of bile salts and bile acids. We will be having lots of pancreatic enzymes and everything will be acting upon the food there only. So what happens that now every this uh, the fat, protein, carbohydrate digestion will, will majorly happen. will start here only. So now coming to the diseases of luminal phase of digestion. So how can we divide that? So there are different, different ways through which these diseases can happen. So one, there can be disorders of gastric and intestinal motility. Suppose there is no, no, either there is hypermotility of uh, uh, the gut or there is uh, less of motility uh, leading to um, defect in the digestion. There can be pancreatic diseases like uh, chronic pancreatitis leading to pancreatic enzyme deficiencies or there can be luminal bile salt deficiency because of any reason. Uh, all these deficiencies, all these defects can lead to uh, hampering of luminal phase of digestion. So we will see some examples uh, and we'll try to understand why it is happening. So now we are seeing some examples of disorders of luminal field digestion. So one thing is gastric recession. So here I have shown you two figures. You can see this figure is basically rho and y gastric bypass that is typically done in case of your bariatric surgery. And then we have here Bildroth 1 and Bildroth type 2 uh, isoperistaltic and antiperistaltic type of surgeries. These surgeries are done in case of your when you have to remove the anterior part of the uh, stomach. So what happens in all these cases, what is happening? Because the lot of uh, tissue has been removed, anatomical tissue has been removed. So what happens that gastric M time is increased. So food is because the, now gastric capacity is less, whatever enter into this in the, in, the, in the small stomach will be rapidly uh, thrown down to the duodenum. So what is happening after gastric session, there is rapid gastric and time that is leading to diarrhea and weight loss. Then uh, there are so many disorders which can uh, hamper the intestinal motility. For example, in case of your hyperthyroidism, what can happen? Because there can be an increased motility of your gut leading to less time for digestion of luminal content. Or there can be long-standing diabetes, scleroderma, where there can be either uh, generally what happens in these diseases, generally in these, these, in these cases, there is reduction in the motility. That leads to sl uh, slowing of digestion, that leads to better overgrowth. Coming to pancreatic diseases, we all know pancreatic diseases, uh, they present with steatoria. That is actually presence of fatty stools. They are voluminous, bulky, and malodorous. Patient may have severe weight loss and deficiency of fat-soluble vitamins, most commonly vitamin D and K, and also A and E. So these are symptoms of pancreatic diseases. Uh, now, something about your uh, bile salt deficiencies. So bile, before going to bile salt deficiencies, I would like to mention here the normal cycle of Enterohepatic circulation. So, what happens generally daily? Uh, roughly 500 milligram of bile acid is being produced from the cholesterol. This is a pathway for that thing. Then, this bile acid is actually stored in your gallbladder, and whenever you eat food, gallbladder is contracted so that this bile can be poured into duodenum. That's how it generally occurs. Then, what happens? This by this bile acid and this bile acid is also conjugated with your taurine and glycine. Simple bile acid is rapidly diffusing back into your mucosa. To avoid that, it is generally conjugated. So taurine and glycine conjugated bile acids will stay in the gut. 
okay so two primary bile acids are cholic acid and quinodeoxycholic acid and then by the action of different enzymes or bacterial actions there can be formation of secondary bile acids and two of the major secondary bile acids are lithocholic acid and deoxycholic acid so what happens uh, all these bile salts and uh, bile acids they enter into your duodenum then go to jejunum ileum and colon so what happens generally these bile acids and bile salts they are they are making they are they are helpful in missile formation when fat is being absorbed roughly roughly 0.5 gram of bile acid is excreted per day and rest of 3.5 gram out of the, out of this 4 gram pool 3.5 gram is is absorbed reabsorbed from jejunum and ileum this is known as enterohepatic circulation so this is actually happening daily four to eight times daily and at least two times once you are having food then this enterohepatic circulation is actually happening so very minimal amount of bile acid is being excreted in the stool and entering into colon so how that's how it happens suppose for any reason if suppose for any reason if this this enterohepatic circulation is disrupted or let's say uh, this is not being absorbed then lot of lot of bile acid will be your excreted into colon and then to rectum that can lead to bile acid diarrhea and because bile acid is required for your fatty acid absorption then subsequently fat will not be absorbed and it can lead to your cytorrhea so there are different processes like hepatobiliary diseases are there intestinal illustrations are there extensive diseases such as Crohn's disease which can lead to impaired uh, bile acid resorption all of these can lead to luminal bile salt deficiency small bacterial small bowel bacterial overgrowth because as you remember i told i told you that bacteria they can actually deconjugate your bile salts once deconjugated these bile acids will be passively diffused back into your mucosa leading to deficiency of these bile acids into gut so that's how bacterial overgrowth is actually leading to your bile uh, bile salt deficiency so all these processes can lead to your luminal bile salt deficiency and subsequently malabsorption. So similarly, there are hepatobiliary diseases like, like primary sclerosis, cholangitis, primary biliary cirrhosis. So all these diseases can lead to impaired bile acid and bile salt production. So now one important concept is there. So there are two kinds of diarrhea that can happen. One is bile acid diarrhea and other is fatty acid diarrhea. We need to understand that they these two are related but different entities. So now understand this that we have small gut, duodenum is there, jejunum is there, ileum is there. So what happens generally, whatever bile uh, salt and bile acids is entering into the gut via the CBD, the duodenum, it is coming down to jejunum and the ileum, and from jejunum to jejunum and ileum, it is getting reabsorbed. So suppose if ileal disease is there a uh, widespread ileal disease is there then this bile acid will not be will not be absorbed or suppose there is ileal dissection is there ileum is not not available at all for this absorption so lots of lots of bile acid will enter into colon colon generally does not have bile so once this bile is entering your colon there is irritation there is uh, bacterial action on these bile acids and lots of lots of diarrhea is happening so this is bile acid diarrhea so what happens suppose if less than 100 centimeter of ileal dissection is there then this bile acid will be will be uh, excreted in the stool but body will be able to uh, able to continue to have enough bile acids to maintain that enterohepatic circulation and the pool so that fatty acid absorption is not hampered but suppose if more than 100 centimeter of your uh, ileal ileum is not available then what will happen then this absorption is hampered and with time what will happen lots of lots of bile acid will be excreted will be lost the pool will reduce and once the pool is reduced then the fat will not be absorbed leading to your fatty acid diarrhea so these are two related but uh, uh, but different entities and this table from harrison is showing the difference between two so in case of your bile acid diarrhea extent of ileal disease is less but it is more in case of your fatty acid diarrhea ileal bile acid absorption is reduced in both the condition but more in case of fatty acid diarrhea 
fecal bile acid excretion is increased in both fecal bile acid loss compensated by hepatic synthesis yes in case of bile acid diarrhea but this compensation compensation is lost in case of your fatty acid diarrhea bile acid pool size is still maintained in your bile acid diarrhea but it is reducing fatty acid diarrhea intradural bile acid is normal because the pool is normal but reducing fatty acid diarrhea Storia is not seen generally in bile acid diarrhea, but it is generally seen in fatty diarrhea. Response to cholestyramine, bile acid diarrhea, yes, because this cholestyramine will bind your bile acid and the colon will be then bile acid free. In case of fatty acid diarrhea, it actually can be worsened. And response to low fat diet is seen in case of fatty acid diarrhea. So now this, this is new entity that there are some people who can have primary bile acid diarrhea so to understand this first we need to understand the normal physiology so what happens whatever bile salt is present in your colon it has a regulation over fgf19 fibroblast core factor 19 and fgf19 has got one one relation with your this enzyme c4 enzyme c4 is 7 alpha hydroxy 4 cholesterol in 3 on this is an enzyme basically so this enzyme is involved in your bile acid production pathway so what happens in general in general bile salts when more bile salts are there in, co in, in your gut then it leads to more of fgf19 more of fgf19 leads to less of your c4 levels less of c4 levels will lead to less of bile acid production so this is how this pool is maintained now 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 realize this some somehow suppose if if your FGF19 levels are low or let's say deficient or abnormally low compared to high bile salts, so what will happen if FGF19 is low, then this enzyme will increase and this enzyme will actually cause, cause your more production of your uh, bile acids. So this is how primary bile acid diarrhea is occurring. So many patients of primary bile acid diarrhea, they will be having reduced FGF19 secretion by their ileal enterocyte and it can lead to your uh, chronic diarrhea because of uh, production of more of bile salts. Treatment simple because bile salt pool has increased. You can provide bile acid sequestrant and your uh, diarrhea will respond. Coming to small bowel bacterial overgrowth. Now we need to understand that why bacteria is overgrown in your gut. In general physiology, your gut is having motility. Your gut is having motility. Everything which is being entered into your gut is going out in some time. Suppose if there is creation of some kind of blind loops in your gut that can happen after surgery. Remember, we talked about Bildog type 1, type 2 and then when why gastric bypass surgery. All these surgeries, all these uh, sections can lead to formation of one or more uh, blind pouches or let's say uh, your aperistaltic part is there, right? So one reason is that for bacterial overgrowth because no nutrients are entering there, no motility is there, bacteria will grow there. Other thing can be there that in diseases where there is impaired motility of your gut, even then your bacterial overgrowth can, can be there. So these, these are some causes which are, the, uh, which are leading to your bacterial overgrowth including your scleroderma bowel. There can be chronic intestinal pseudo obstructions, blind surgical loops, as we discussed, small bowel strictures. There can be fibrosis or diffuse diabetic losses, or sometimes in case of your irritable bowel syndromes, diarrhea predominant uh, IBS type can also have bacterial overgrowth. Now, remember, this is the reason why, in case of your IBS, uh, diarrhea predominant, we are giving rifaxin, if you remember. So, many patients of IBSD, they have uh, bacterial overgrowth. Providing rifaxin can lead to less of this bacterial overgrowth and that can ameliorate your symptoms of IBS. So what happens basically all these bacterial overgrowth lead to more deconjugation of your bile salts. More deconjugation means less of bile available for absorption of your fat. It can lead to your fatty acid malabsorption and then diarrhea can happen. With time, what can happen if bacterial overgrowth is there, these bacteria can produce various kind of toxins that can directly lead to damage to your mucosa of the gut. Because most of these bacteria, they need vitamin B12 for their development itself. So in the long term, this small bowel bacterial overgrowth can lead to, lead to uh, reduce serum vitamin B12 levels. But as these bacteria are producing folate, this folate can be absorbed. So 
characteristically in case of small bowel bacterial overgrowth, patients have low beta levels, but normal or elevated folic acid levels. Diagnosis, there are two methods. You can either go for duodenal aspirate, that is gold standard. You can look for the increased bacterial count. And the other test is breath hydrogen test after lactulose. So what you can do, you give patients some lactulose. Lactulose goes into your gut. If there are more bacteria, that means there will be more fermentation lactulose. If more fermentation lactulose, more hydrogen gas will be produced. So you can look for the presence of hydrogen in parts per million in your ex exhaled um, uh, breath. And, and there you can uh, look for the increase. And that in that suggests that there are more bacteria in your, your gut. But this has got high false positivity test because in, in, in the cases where gastric emptying is delayed or let's say there is a slow motility of the gut, in all those cases also this test will be positive. That's why the gold standard is duodenal aspirate. Treatment simple, bacteria is more, give you, you should give antibiotics, antibiotics especially which have low bioavailability, anti antibiotics which are retained in the gut are more useful. Uh, these include your rifaximin or metronidazole, doxycycline, amoxicillin, clavinic acid or cephalosporins. Generally, they are given for several weeks. Also, in, in some conditions and some uh, physicians, they are giving in rotary basis also. And in case of your blind loops uh, and blind loops are there, suppose some surgical cause are there, then you can go for a surgical correction. So, so far we have discussed about luminal phase. Now we are entering to the mucosal phase of digestion. Now we discuss about the abnormality into the mucosa of the gut. So we already have discussed this part that we have so many enzymes in the mucosa and uh, all these enzymes are are uh, continuing the digestion process which already started in the luminal phase. So intestinal mucosal disorders, first we will see the disorders uh, which are due to specific enzyme defects and in these we will discuss lac lactose intolerance first. So we all know that we uh, all know that milk has got your lactose and lactose is digested by your lactase. When we are small kid, we all have uh, lots of lactase in our gut. But as we grow older, we lose that enzyme. Generally, it happens, and this is the most common uh, cause of lactose intolerance. So lactose is nothing but it's a glucose and lactose uh, combined together. Lactose is disaccharide found in milk products and it is important because it is utilized for development of certain glycolipids, glycoproteins and glycoglycans. All these things are useful in your CNS development. So lactose intolerance is most common, brush water, disaccharides deficiency, symptoms are diarrhea, abdominal pain, gassiness and bloating. Types, it can be primary, adult type hypolactasia because of loss of lactase with time. Secondary, because of other diseases, let's say IBD is there or some other disease that is affecting the mucosa. Or there can be primary congenital lactase deficiency, which is very rare and it manifests itself in the uh, infancy, infancy itself. Then mechanical diarrhea. So what is happening? Basically, whatever lact lactose is there, it is not being absorbed. So first thing, it is osmotically active. It can draw lots of water. Other thing is this lactose can be broken down into different molecules by the action of bacteria, producing much of much of osmotically active substances, which can also uh, lead to your uh, uh, diarrhea. And because when this lactose is broken down by the bacteria, this production of lots of gases, like hydrogen, carbon dioxide, methane, all these things lead to your bloating and abdominal pain. Okay, diagnosis, simple. The thing is, if you ask somebody to uh, exclude lactose from diet and symptoms are improving, this is highly suggestive of lactose intolerance. Or we can go for a lactose tolerance test or breath hydrogen test uh, to look for whether really there is a lactose intolerance. So in case of your lactose intolerance test, what you are doing, basically you are giving a lactose load to patient. We give 50 gram of lactose to patient and we uh, measure a serum glucose level after 90 minutes. Suppose somebody is having normal lactase, then lactose will be digested, will be absorbed in the form of glucose and lactose in the blood, and then, then the blood glucose will increase. So more than uh, 20 milligram of uh, blood glucose level will be increased with this distress in normal people. Suppose somebody is having your lactase deficiency, then the rise will be less than 20. And also patient will develop typical characteristic symptoms of his which he was having earlier. The other test is your breath hydrogen test. I 
told you al already that what you can do, you can give a standard lact lactose load. Then because if lactose deficiency is there, then this lactose will be remaining in gut itself, will be acted upon by the bacteria that will produce hydrogen. Hydrogen will be exhaled in your breath. That can be measured if there is more than 20 parts per million increase in breath hydrogen levels within two to four hours. It is also suggestive of your uh, lactose lactose deficiency. But thing is, these tests can be very very false, positive or negative. They can have so many caveats. So some other conditions like abnormal gastric emptying or abnormal intestine transit time or bacterial overgrowth can lead to false positivity of these tests. Treatment treatment is simple. What you can do, you can simply completely eliminate lactose from their diets because. Uh, uh, lactose is pre present in most of the milk products. Uh, to avoid lactose, people also avoid your milk products that can lead to calcium and vitamin D deficiency. So go for calcium and vitamin D supplementation. Okay, some lactase supplementation is available over the counter, but they are generally a little costlier and the efficacy of the same has not been proven. Then uh, this glucose and lactose malabsorption disease is there and this is because of defect in your uh, uh, SGLT1. And uh, this defect in SGLT1 is your causing, this is the reason why they, they are not able to absorb glucose lactose, but they have normal glut 5, so fructose can be absorbed. So treatment is simple, you can eliminate glucose and lactose from the food, you can give purely fructose and that's how they can uh, respond to it. A-beta lipoproteinemia. So now understand this, what is happening? We know that beta apple lipoprotein B is required to form chylomicrons with the help of triglyceride, and that's how the the fat is being absorbed. So in A beta lipoproteinemia, it is a rare disease, and uh, there is abnormal erythrocytes. And they are having so much, so many spicules on their surface. They are known as acanthocytes. A beta lipoprotein is actually the normal component of that RBC membrane. Also, if it is not there, then the shape of the RBC membrane changes. And it is in the form of acanthocytes. So a beta lipoproteinemia can have erythrocyte abnormality, acanthocytes, neurological symptoms, dementia, memory loss, and pseudoria. So problem is the same. What happens actually because this there is a defect in your this protein is there, microsomal triglyceride transfer protein is there. This protein deficiency is there, which is which because of this protein deficiency or defect, there is a problem of apple lipoprotein B binding with triglyceride. Once apple lipoprotein B is not binding with triglyceride, it leads to your no formation of chylomicrons. So what happens in these patients? Your triglyceride is absorbed. It is in there. It is there in your jejunum and ileum uh, mucosa, but it is not getting transported further. So if you do biopsy in these patients after a fat load, you will be able to see the fat laden uh, mucosa of jejunum and ileum in these patients. So now coming to intestinal mucosal disorders resulting into multiple nutrient deficiencies and we all know about celiac disease. We all have heard about it. There are so many MCQs and uh, there are so many, uh, <clears throat> even clinically also you will see so many patients with celiac disease and they can present with very manifestation. So celiac term has come from celia, celiac, celiac is term has come from calis and calus term has, is a Dutch term which is referring to your uh, belly. So any problem, this is basically problem of the belly. Indigestion, celiac disease, also known as celiac flu or gluten sensitive enteropathy. Uh, so basically, it is a kind of small intestinal enteropathy which is immune response to gluten ingestion and is characterized by autoantibody to tissue transglutaminase. Gluten is found in food products from wheat, rye, barley, and some varieties of oats. You should remember that rice and maize generally they will not be having uh, presence of gluten and can be given in, as a gluten free diet. So what happens, your tissue transglutaminase enzyme, tissue transglutaminase enzyme, which is actually uh, deaminating your, your glutamine residue of gluten and it is forming your, uh, uh, the antigen, the antigen towards which there is a response uh, by antibody formation. So in this disease, what is actually, what is actually happening, deaminated, uh, uh, this gluten is there, basically gliding is there, against which antibodies are forming. With time, also there is formation of antibodies again against uh, tissue transglutaminase A, tissue transglutaminase enzyme, and also there is uh, formation of antibodies again endomycin. So anti-endomycin antibodies will be there, anti-gladin antibodies will be there, anti-tissue transglutaminase 
IgA as well as IgG will be there. So there are lots of antibody formation. Because of these antibodies, there's attack on your, maybe like brush border of your uh, small intestine. There can be this atrophy with time. And because of the response, in the compensatory response, there will be lots of lots of crypt hyperplasia in these patients. Okay, so the studies have shown that the incidence of uh, celiac disease is increasing worldwide. There is increased prevalence as well as there is increased awareness uh, uh, regarding the disease. Celiac disease can be seen as in as many as 10 to 15% of first day relatives of the patient. Actually, DQ2 and DQ8 are found in 25 to 35% of the general population. And is it's, it's uh, basically what happens, actually DQ2 and DQ8 has got a negative predictive value. Means if these are not there, then celiac disease possibly is not there. So what you can do, any patient who was supposed to have a gluten sensitive enteropathy and somehow they have stopped their gluten food intake and now they are not having any kind of uh, antibodies. In such patients where you want to negate, you want to rule out the possibility of celiac disease, in those cases what you can do, you can go for a HLDQ2 and DQ8 testing because it has got a negative parity value of more than 99%. It means if somebody is not having HLDQ2, DQ8, not having any antibodies, then probably you are not dealing with a patient of celiac disease. Okay. So this is particularly helpful in patients who self discontinued gluten ingestion prior to serologic or endoscopic testing. Presentation. So wide variety of manifestations. They can be asymptomatic. They can have isolated iron deficiency anemia or they can have severe diarrhea, weight loss, malnutrition or multiple nutrients with more diffuse disease. This disease primarily affect your duodenum and some part of uh, some part of judgment, it will not it will not uh, inv involve uh, the distal part generally. And diarrhea, weight loss, growth failure can be there in children. In case of uh, your uh, uh, adults, also there can be symptoms of uh, IBS-like symptoms. There can be migraine headaches. There can be ataxia. Patient uh, may have some may also be presented with the complication of nutrient deficiencies like osteoporosis, iron deficiency, anemia, or abnormal LFTs. So why there is diarrhea in case of your uh, uh, patients of uh, celiac disease? So I told you already there is villus atrophy because of villus atrophy there is no absorption of nutrients. Also there, there is script hyperplasia with time that can lead to your secretory component. So celiac disease will be having both osmotic as well as secretory component of diarrhea. So some diseases are there which are associated with your uh, uh, Celiac disease. So one is type 1 diabetic mellitus, then there is autoimmune thyroid diseases and dermatitis herpetiformis. So these three diseases are there which are associated with celiac disease. Also in case of your Down syndrome and Turner syndrome, the prevalence of celiac disease is higher in comparison to general population. So how do you diagnose these patients? So one thing is you can go for screening or you can go for confirmation. For screening, we can go simply for antibodies like tissue transglutamine is IgA, anti-endomycin antibody, and d mediated anti gladin antibodies. Now remember, selective Ig deficiency is very common in the population, 1 is to 600 or 500. So it is quite possible if you check only for Ig type of tissue transmutaminase, if patient is having selective Ig deficiency, then you might not find these antibodies. If your suspicion is high, then you should also look for tissue transmutaminase IgG types. For confirmation, we are going for the biopsy. So what we can do, we can go for a biopsy in an appropriate history setting. We can find the characteristic pelvis blunting, crypt hyperplasia, and some amount of inflammation, including increased intraepithelial lymphocytes can be seen. We use MARSH scoring system to quantify and to see the severity of finding in the biopsy of patients of celiac disease. Complications which can develop in patients of celiac disease include refractive celiac disease, enteropathy associated T cell lymphoma, hypospinism or small bowel adenocarcinoma. So what is effective celiac disease? So basically what happens, many patients who has developed your gluten sensitive, uh, many patients who have developed this uh, celiac disease, even if you stop uh, intake of gluten for more than a year and these patients are not responding, then you label them as refractory celiac disease. So these patients will not be having any kind of antibodies. They will also be adhering to the gluten-free diet. Despite doing all these measures, patients will be having symptoms. 
Refractory ciliate disease can be of two types, type 1 and type 2. In type 1, it has a normal intraepithelial lymphocyte like seen in ciliate disease. In type 2, which is more severe and have worse prognosis, will be containing clonal expansion of CD3 positive intraepithelial lymphocyte and they will be having a monoclonal arrangement to the gamma chain of T cell receptor. And this type 2 refractory ciliate disease is worse because in 30 to 50 percent of patients, there can be development of T cell lymphoma in next five years. Treatment simple institution of a strict gluten free diet. The problem is that nowadays gluten is so much into our food habits, uh, food materials as well as other materials also contains gluten, and patient can be having uh, repeated exposure to gluten uh, without uh, his or her knowing. And then we can have a dietary consultation from dietitian uh, regularly to uh, look for the gluten free diet. Then patient. Uh, who patient in which the symptoms are resolved, what we can do, how can we follow? You can follow by looking for the presence of antibodies. So what happens generally, there is no uh, more ongoing exposure to gluten. These antibodies become negative and symptoms will improve. Also, biopsy recommended once when symptoms are improved to look for the uh, regrowth of your, uh, your villi and the abnormality of your uh, biopsy but it is not recommended there is no recommendation for serial biopsies however if patients of celiac disease they again develop symptoms then biopsy can be recommended suppose the patient of celiac disease is not improving at all after doing after giving gluten free diets or let's say after following everything then we must look for other causes which can present similar to celiac disease these include atrial ball syndrome microscopic colitis small bowel bacterial overgrowth or lactose or fructose intolerance Coming to non-celiac gluten sensitivity, now this is a new concept. Some patients may not have presence of antibodies against uh, all these antigens in celiac disease. Some patients might may not have any biopsy finding. Even then, when they take gluten-containing uh, food material, they develop symptoms similar to celiac disease. So this is a new subset. Uh, patient has been described with symptoms consistent with celiac disease, but with negative serology and negative biopsies. Upon discontinuation of gluten, they have relief of abdominal pain, diarrhea, headache, migraine, and other celiac disease type symptoms. So this is known as non-celiac gluten sensitivity. We don't know what is the etiology of this, this disease so far. Coming to Epil's disease, we all know this is an infective condition caused by epili, a gram-positive bacteria, non-acid fast but pass positive rods. Then most commonly Epil's disease seen in your middle-aged man. man and classically, there is involvement of joints, involvement of CNS and gut. Generally, the first thing which is which is involved in these patients is the 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 arthralgia and arthritis is there, which can be seen as much as six years earlier to your GI symptoms. So, patient may have monoarthritis, patient may have oligoarthritis. So, these patients then later on will develop your abdominal symptoms in terms of your uh, diarrhea, abdominal pain, weight loss, and weight loss because of mal malabsorption. Then subsequently, there can be involvement of CNS leading to uh, psychiatric manifestations or memory problems, dementia, or encephalitis may occur in later stages. Cardiac involvement in uh, in some patient can be there in terms of endocarditis, pericarditis, and myocarditis. So how you diagnose and treat these patients? Simple, go for a biopsy, do a PCR for trophy or in the biopsy, you can see presence of past positive macrophages and immunohistochemistry can be done to look for profile of life. Treatment is difficult. Generally, treatment is done for a year or so. Septran, uh, double strand BD can be given for one year or the other regime is doxycycline plus hydroxychloroquine can be given for one year. Coming tropical sprue. So now tropical sprue, sprue is very dubious kind of entity. Not seen everywhere, but commonly seen in India. And... Uh, some part of um, globe like Puerto Rico. So there are lots of controversy about this because uh, the, the, the thing is that it, it is to be considered as an infective entity, but no specific infection so far has been seen. It is a poorly understood syndrome manifested by chronic diarrhea, steatoria, weight loss, nutrient deficiencies, including both folate and B12. And there will be malabsorption of two unrelated substances is required for diagnosis. 
and this occurs in 8 to 20 percent of people who have had an attack of infectious gastroenteritis in India and is considered by some to be a post infectious complication. So, what happens generally, travelers when they travel to Puerto Rico, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, or other countries, there they will they may develop some infection, some diarrhea that is resolved, and once they go back to their place, they will still having diarrhea without having any uh, organism positivity in their stools. So that's how they're considering it a post-infectious uh, complication. Also, many of these patients, they have folate deficiency. It has been speculated that probably your folate deficiency can be a contributory factor because with the use of antibiotics, the prevalence of tropical spur is going down. And also to antibiotics, cases, cases of tropical spur response, these are the hints, soft hints, which suggest that probably tropical spur is an infective etiology. So uh, before uh, we diagnose somebody with tropical sprue, we have to have at least three stool samples, which are sterile. And uh, in the past few years, the term environmental anthropathy has been introduced as diagnosis of many patients, especially infant and children who had previously been diagnosed with tropical sprue. However, we don't know for as if now whether environmental anthropathy and tropical sprue are the same thing. So clinically, Simple. So what happens once infection has occurred in a country, then they, they these people, they will leave the country, they will go back to their country and where, there they will be having recurrent, episodes, uh, recurrent episodes of diarrhea. Uh, little bit difference is there between India and the Puerto Rico patient because in case of your Puerto Rico patient, <clears throat> more insidious onset of symptoms and more dramatic response to antibiotic is seen. But in India, the 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 incident in this onset is very slow, and the response to antibiotic is not that good. Tropical flu in different areas of the world may not be the same disease, and similar clinical entities may have different etiologies. Differences are there between tropical flu and celiac flu. Tropical flu is also known as non-celiac flu, or celiac flu is also known as non-tropical flu. So, what happens if we do a biopsy in patient of tropical flu and compare? Compare the finding with celiac sprue. In the case of your tropical sprue, villus architecture alteration is very less compared to celiac sprue. But tropical sprue biopsy contains more of mononuclear cell infiltrate. That suggests that there would have been an infection. If we see the involvement in case of celiac disease, as we already discussed, we have more severe involvement to the proximal part, duodenum and jejunum. But in tropical sprue, the whole gut is involved. If we provide gluten-free diet, the response will be there in case of celiac sprue. If we provide antibiotic, the response will be there in tropical sprue. So these are some sort of points which can differentiate between tropical sprue and celiac sprue. Treatment. Treatment is simple. We are considering it as an infective uh, complication. So we treat the infection. Uh, tetracycline can be given for six months. We can provide adequate folic acid supplementation as folic acid deficiency has to be known to be contributing to the pathology of tropical sprue. Talk about short bowel syndrome. So short bowel syndrome is seen in surgical cases. Patients, patients who have undergone surgeries and whose intestine has been removed and only less than two meter of small bowel is remaining, these patients can have short bowel syndrome. If somebody is having less than one meter of uh, uh, intestine is, is remaining, then all the function of small intestine is lost and we can we can we call it like an intestinal failure. So in adults and children, there are few causes which can lead to your short bowel syndrome. In adults, there can be mesenteric arterial venous thrombosis resulting into intestinal ischemia. There can be volvulus trauma. There can be internal herniations, radiation enteritis, or diffuse carcinomas. Uh, these are some causes which can involve your short bowel, and there can be recession of short bowel, and that can lead to short bowel syndrome. In general, children generally, generally necrotizing enterocolitis, intestinal atresia, valvulus, and malnutrition the causes of short bowel syndrome. So clinical picture, generally what happens, you can you can see there will be some patient in your surgical ward with the, in a post-op state when already the lots of uh, length of your small intestine has been resected and removed. These patients mostly will be having severe diarrhea, they'll be having weight loss, they'll be having deficiency of multiple nutrients, and also most of them will be receiving total parental nutrition. <clears throat> so complications that can develop in these patients include vitamin D deficiency, they can develop fracture because of that, then they can bacterial overgrowth if there are blind loops, renal calcium, oxalate stones are there. So what happens in general, these oxalate, whatever oxalate they are eating in our food, 
it binds with your calcium. Suppose somebody is having short bowel syndrome, then what will happen? Fat will not be absorbed. Once this fat will not be absorbed, this fat will bind with the calcium, leading to saponification. Oxalate remains unbounded. This oxalate will be absorbed into blood, then it will be again be filtered and come to your kidney. And once come to kidney, because oxalate has increased now, it will bind with some calcium. Calcium oxalate stones will form. That's how the calcium oxalate stones are forming in patient of short bowel syndrome. Treatment. Treatment is simple. You can control diarrhea and normalize nutrients. You can do. You can provide medications like opiate, lopramide, diphenoxylate, atropine to reduce the bowel motility. You can provide PPIs to reduce the gastric hypersecretion, and uh, you can treat the small bacterial or small bowel bacterial overgrowth using antibiotics. And uh, one specific medication that has been used in short bowel syndrome uh, is tadoglutide a glucogon-like peptide analog that enhances Krebs cell proliferation and will cyproblasia and increases nutrient and fluid and lipid absorption. For dietary therapy, you can provide uh, three to four times of the calorie intake that is normally needed for these patients. You can start early feeding in this patient because once you start feeding, the gut, gut becomes more healthy because it requires a required uh, uh, presence of nutrients within them. Then if the patient has all parts, all the part of the colon remaining in continuity, a low fat diet is instituted to reduce the concentration of malabsorbed fatty acid that induces secreted diarrhea. So if you increase fat, more shituria will happen. So you have to keep a low fat diet in these patients. High complex carbohydrates are encouraged because when malabsorbed and present in the colon, what can happen because of the bacterial action, lots of short chain fatty acids will be formed and they can provide the adequate calories. Or you can provide also high potency multivitamin on daily basis of these patients. Suppose if after doing all these measures, if your patient are not able to have enough nutrient nutrition, then you can go for a TPN therapy, total parental nutrition therapy. Now coming to disorders of post mucosal absorption. So so far we have discussed about the luminal phase. We have discussed for the mucosal phase. Now we are going for the post mucosal phase. So now remember, whatever food material have been absorbed from your gut. Either it will travel through your portal vein or it will travel through your uh, lymphatics. So big fat molecules, chylomicrons, triglycerides are there uh, from chylomicrons. They all enter your lymphatics and all peptides and uh, monosaccharides, they will enter your portal vein, go to the liver. This is how it is happening. So disorders of post-mucosal absorption can happen if the portal vein blood flow or the lymphatic blood flow Somewhere is hampered. Once it is hampered, then there's absorption. Whatever they, it has been absorbed, it cannot go further, or there can be a, a badly kind of condition. So let's say uh, <clears throat> if we see uh, the, the causes for post mucosal absorption, there can be primary lymphatic causes, secondary lymphatic causes, or circulatory causes. In case of your primary lymphatic causes, intestinal lymphangiectasia can be there that can be not required. Or there can be secondary lymphatic obstructions because of either fibrosis or mesenteritis or lymphoma. If some other pathologies, tumor is there, all these can lead to obstruction or compression of lymphatics. Then circulatory causes are there, like you have congestive heart failure, congestive pericarditis there, fontan physiology is there. So all these can lead to your uh, back. So whatever the cause is and result of is damage to lymphatic channels and that lead to malabsorption and diarrhea with concomitant protein losing enteropathy. So protein losing enteropathy is an entity which is defined as large group of GI and non-GI disorders which is characterized by hyperproteinemia and edema in the absence of liver disease with reduced protein synthesis or kidney disease protein area. So funda is suppose if somebody's kidney is okay, somebody's liver is okay, adequate amount of protein is being synthesized in liver and there is no loss of protein from kidney then probably patient is losing because of any reason patient is losing protein from the gut so uh, there can be various causes of why protein is losing from your gut so one is your mucosal ulceration so what can happen because there is uh, lots of inflammation and damage to mucosa there can be exudation from your uh, damaged mucosa, like in case of your ulcerative colitis or some cancers. There can be non-ulcerated mucosa, but with the evidence of mucosal damage. For example, there can be altered permeability. 
celiac disease or menetrize disease, hypertrophic gastropathy is there, or there can be lymphoid dysfunction. So what happens in case of lymphatic dysfunction? Basically, lymphatic obstruction is somewhere because of the lymphatic channels are opening your gut and everything is uh, being lost from the lymphatics from the gut. Now, this is very important slide because whenever you deal with a patient in your clinics, you have to see both the levels of albumin and globulin. In protein losing enteropathy, your patient will lose albumin as well as globulin. So a patient who's having edema, not having any uh, liver disease or renal disease and having low levels of both your albumin and globin probably having protein losing atropathy. Suppose somebody is having only low albumin, either there is a hepatic disease leading to less synthesis or there is a renal disease because that is leading to more of uh, urinary protein excretion. Suppose somebody is having only low globulin, then probably the, there is a reduced globin, globulin synthesis. So, how do you diagnose this patient? Apart from the clinical history and presentation, you can go for a stool alpha antitrypsin levels. So, alpha 1 antitrypsin level can be measured in a spot or 24 hours to correction. And it, if it is elevated, elevated it is diagnostic of your protein losing entropathy. This is one protein which is being lost in your gut and that's why it is being measured. Other thing is you can go look for a alpha antitrypsin clearance. What you can do, you can measure stool volume and you can measure the alpha 1 antitrypsin levels in plasma and stool both and then you can look for the clearance. If alpha antitrypsin clearance is increased, it, increased, it is more specific a finding for protein losing entropy. In case of lymphangiectasia ectasia, causes, there is also relatively specific loss of your CD3 positive T cells leading to lymphopenia. So protein losing entropathies with lymphopenia mostly are dealing with the lymphangiectasia cause. Clinical features, diarrhea will be there, there can be storia, there can be in patients of your intestinal lymphangi ectasia, uh, there can be mechanical lymphatic obstruction, there can be lymphatic, lymphatic dysfunction uh, with, without any lymphatic dysfunction in peripheral activities. So what can happen? Apart from steatoria and enhanced protein loss into GI tract, generally all other aspects of intestinal functions are normal in intestinal lymphangiectasia. Treatment, treat the underlying cause, intestinal lymphangiectasia is there, you can give low fat diet, high protein diet and the administration of medium chain triglyceride because medium chain triglyceride they are being absorbed to portal vein, not through lymphatics. Uh, then what you can do, you can give other medications are there, octotide, heparin, bridesonide, but none of these medications have been proven so far effective. So treatment of uh, lymphangiectasia, protein losing entropathy is you give a low fat, high protein diet, or if you want to give fat, give medium chain fatty acids, which will be absorbed through portal vein. Then uh, now how do you approach a patient who is present to you with malabsorption? So first thing is you can go for the history. So you can look for the history. There are so many symptoms through by, uh, with which the patient can present weight loss, diarrhea, platelets, glycitis, pain, bone pain, tetany, weakness, azotemia, anemia. So these are very known specific symptoms, but still can provide you clues. Like for example, night blindness is there. You can look for vitamin A malabsorption. Somebody having dermatitis, you can look for vitamin A, zinc, or fatty deficiencies. Then you can go for physical examination. Your patient either may not have any findings or they can find in for specific nutrient deficiencies. For example, suppose somebody is having nail spooning, then probably iron deficiency is there. Somebody is having pyphoneuropathy, then probably vitamin deficiency is there. In that way, you can look for it. Apart from that, you can look for the uh, nutrition assessment, weight you can check, you can check for bad temporal vesting, you can check for the reduced arm circumference. In labs, you can look for shidoria. You can check for fecal fat fat by by staining your stool on third diet. It's a qualitative test. You can go for stool for elastase. It is a, a test done for chronic pancreatic insufficiency. Or you can go for 24 assessment of stool volume by weight. This is actually helpful in patients where you are suspecting diarrhea is not there. A patient is telling diarrhea. For example, somebody can present to you with just proctitis. So there is increased frequency of stool because of the local inflammation, but there is no increased volume of stool. In such cases, you can go for 24 hour assessment of stool volume or weight. Then there is 72 hour fecal fat collection. Uh, you give a patient 100 gram fat diet and then for three days you collect this uh, the stool amount and then you look for the percentage of stool. So, so suppose somebody is having more than 7% of uh, the ingested fat, then probably patient is having 
then you can look for the stool osmolality. This is specifically used in patients who are having either having osmotic diarrhea or patient where there is a factitious, factitious diarrhea like condition. So what you can do, you can look for, uh, you can uh, measure sodium and potassium content in stool. You can calculate the osmotic gap. A 290 is taken as the osmolality of the serum roughly and 290 minus 2 into stool sodium plus potassium. This is the value. This is how you are calculating the osmolar gap. So what happens, suppose, if somebody is having more than 50 of this osmolar gap, then, then probably there is, is a osmotically active substance present in your stool. So this is how you can utilize this test in your patients. Urinary dialogue test, now test is obsolete, nobody uses it so far, but it is mentioned in Harrison, so uh, we are covering it up. So what happened, these allos is a pentose sugar, which is almost exclusively is absorbed in your proximal small intestine and is excreted in the urine. So what you can do, you can provide your patient these allos challenge, 25 gram of it, and then after five hours, you can see how much of this has come into urine. So generally, the whole of it should come into urine. But if less than 4.5 gram of it is appearing into urine, then probably the absorption part is, is hampered in your gut. But problem is, the result can be false positive if there is delayed gastric emptying, there is impaired yield function, or there is sequestration of the desilos in the third space loss. So in these cases, this will not be utilizable. Now we have so many tests available. We can do biopsy also. Why to go for this test then? We can go for a radio examination. We can do contrast in NCTs. We can various kinds of uh, barrier meal tests. We can look for structure, fistulas or valvulas or other pathologies can be uh, visible with the help of these techniques. And then we can go for endoscopy and biopsies. We can look for diffuse specific, patchy specific, diffuse zone specific lesions. These endoscopic and biopsy finding also can be endoscopy and then biopsy can also be helpful to deal in the cause of, of malnutrition in your patient. So to conclude in our lecture, Disorders of absorption is commonly present as diarrhea, bloating, storia, or weight loss. Try to delineate the site of the defect, whether luminal, mucosal, or post-mucosal. Dietary history and physical findings can provide an important clue. So here we conclude our, our uh, presentation. Here I want to say that if suppose you have any doubt, we have gone a little faster today because it was a big topic. Even then, if you have some doubt or you are not understanding any concept, you can comment in the comment box and uh, you can contact me. If uh, if I will knowing it, I will let you know the answer. If suppose there is something which I don't know, I will read and let you know. So, uh, uh, so here is the end of this lecture and I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it will help you out to understand the concept better. And uh, now I will see you in your next class. Thank you so much.